Well, why don't we get started? Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Brad Beauvais. Uh, we have many members of the NAPS Consortium uh, participating and uh, we uh, greatly welcome all of the uh, uh, public participants as part of this uh, uh, webinar. This is the first one that we've uh, uh, held. We hope that this is uh, informative and uh, we welcome questions. Uh, if you're uh, familiar with how to ask questions, um, the best way is through Zoom is to click on the Q&A button and you can type in questions we, we also have some already submitted questions and we'll start uh, the um, uh, session later uh, and respond to those questions. Uh, so quick um, introduction, there are many uh, faces that can be seen on the Zoom call. Um, just to introduce the key speakers uh, first, uh, we're led by Yoel Ju. Uh, Dr. Ju is from Washington University. She's the uh, main PI of the NAPS Consortium. Uh, she'll be speaking uh, in a, a bit. Um, Drs. Uh, uh, Elan Avedon and Alex Vedenovich. Uh, Dr. Avedon is from UCLA. Uh, Dr. Vedenovich from uh, Harvard in Boston. Um, and we'll, we will begin with Dr. Carlo Schenk from the University of Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Schenk, along with our late uh, good friend and colleague, Dr. Mark Mahawald, first described REM sleep behavior disorder almost 40 years ago. And uh, why don't we begin with our good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Schenk. Hello. Thank you very much for allowing me to talk about REM sleep behavior disorder. I'm Dr. Carlos Schenk from the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Regional Sleep Disorder Center. Uh, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Uh, I wanna start out the introduction to REM sleep behavior disorder with a definition of the parasomnias because REM sleep behavior disorder or RBD is a parasomnia. It's an, uh, the parasomnias are undesirable behavioral autonomic nervous system and experiential events that occur during entry into sleep, during any stage of sleep, either non-REM sleep or REM sleep, during partial or full arousals from any stage of sleep. And this comes from the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, third edition. Uh, now, with parasomnias, instinctual behaviors and experiences emerge pathologically during sleep taking the form of sexual behaviors, and there's a condition called sexomnia, abnormally eating behaviors during sleep, called sleep-related eating disorder, aggressive behavior during sleep, and that is one of the hallmarks of REM sleep behavior disorder, or RBD, but also with adults having sleepwalking and sleep terrors, locomotion with sleepwalking and sometimes of RBD, and fear with night terrors, and also sometimes with RBD. Uh, the essential features of RBD uh, consist of abnormal behaviors that usually consist of dream and acting behaviors that emerge during REM sleep, causing injury or sleep disruption. Uh, RBD is associated with increased muscle tone and or increased muscle twitching during REM sleep as the uh, objective hallmark of this condition. And uh, here is a very fine example of loss of, uh, of uh, complete obliteration of the muscle paralysis of REM sleep in the chin, the arm muscle uh, recording devices, and the legs. And you can see very dense rapid eye movements that occur during REM sleep. So you have hardly any muscle paralysis. Now this is normal little twitching that can occur during normal REM sleep, but everything else you see is tremendous increase of muscle tone and muscle twitching during REM sleep. And back in the days when we had paper uh, polysomnograms, the technologists at 4.12 in the morning, late in the night when REM sleep predominates, wrote that the patient was flailing his arms and the right arm was reaching in a circular motion. When this man awakened, he reported a dream when in fact he was using his right arm and moving it in a circular motion. So the dream action completely matched the observed behaviors. Now, uh, the loss of muscle paralysis that is a characteristic of REM sleep is completely lost during REM sleep behavior disorder. And this is a core universal feature with the objective finding as I showed you in the previous slide. Now you have a whole spectrum of behaviors that can emerge with this loss of muscle paralysis of REM sleep. You can have limb twitching and jerking, more complex behaviors consisting of hand waving, hand grabbing, reaching and searching motions. 
along with various gestures. You can have vigorous and violent behaviors involving punching and kicking. You can have a whole spectrum of vocalizations from talking, yelling, including yelling profanities, anger, and laughter. The dreams that are enacted are usually very altered dreams, so much more vivid, intense, action-packed, unpleasant. We call that dream process change. Also, the dreamer is being threatened or attacked by unfamiliar people, animals, or insects. We call that dream content change. And the dreamer is very rarely the primary aggressor. Uh, RBD can result in uh, various very serious injuries uh, from bruising, uh, hematomas, uh, lacerations, including lacerated arteries, nerves, and tendons, fractures, uh, dislocated digits, uh, abrasions, rug burns, and even uh, tooth chipping and hair pulling. Now, um, my colleagues and I first identified REM sleep behavior disorder in 1986, and this is our first publication in the journal Sleep, uh, entitled Chronic Behavioral Disorders of Human REM Sleep, a New Category of Parasomnia. Uh, the index patient presented to me on September 11th, 1982, a gentleman named Donald Dorff, 67 years old from Golden Valley, Minnesota. He'd been happily married 41 years. And he had a beautiful description of his RBD saying, I have physical moving dreams. I have violent moving nightmares. And the reason he finally came to us was he had a football dream. Uh, he was the halfback carrying the football through the line of scrimmage. And he got flattened by a 280 pound lineman who threw him to the ground. Now at that point, Donald Dorff awakened and he was shocked to realize that he was in his bedroom and not on the football. Uh, he was totally enmeshed in his dream, thinking he was a football player. Unfortunately, he had run into the dresser on the other side of his bedroom and gashed his forehead. So he went to his doctor who found no uh, medical problem. The doctor at that point in time very reasonably sent him to a psychiatrist who also found no problem. And finally, he was referred to our sleep center because at that point in time, sleep centers were just beginning to emerge. And that's how we uh, identified our index patient with REM sleep behavior disorder. And uh, after a few years, we found four other patients. And so we submitted those five cases for publication in the journal Sleep. Here's Mr. Dorff, very nice man. I should point out that he was a grocer throughout his career and he loved playing golf. And uh, he was dreaming of his retirement for a long time. So he was really not very happy after his retirement to develop REM behavior disorder, gashing his forehead during his sleep. And uh, so we had to really scramble to find effective treatment. Fortunately, he also had uh, uh, leg jerks during non-REM sleep called uh, nocturnal myoclonus that we now call periodic limb movements. And at that point in time, clonazepam, a uh, very particular medication was effective for treating nocturnal myoclonus. So we decided to use this medicine for one sleep behavior problem uh, for a REM behavior disorder, another sleep behavior problem, and lo and behold, it became very effective and then he was very pleased he could play golf and not worry about having strange and dangerous dreams. This is our second patient, uh, Mr. Mel Abel. And this is how he had to sleep for years at night because of his REM behavior disorder. He had to uh, put a belt around his waist and tether his belt to his bedpost so he would not fly out of bed and get hurt. He was happily married to, uh, to Harriet and uh, he had a very dramatic episode of dream enactment that actually was uh, captured for stories in uh, Stern Magazine in Germany with the title Hunting Deer Under the Blanket and also the New York Times Sunday Magazine story February 2nd, 2003 with the title of The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Deer. In this dream, Mel was hunting a deer. He shot it but didn't kill it. And he wanted to put the deer out of its misery. So he put his hands all around the deer's neck and was about to snap the deer's neck to end its misery when in, when in fact in bed he was hearing his wife Harriet screaming at him because he had his hands around Harriet's neck and uh, he could have killed her uh, and they were both crying when they related that anecdote to me so it's very very oops, sorry it's very disconcerting and potentially dangerous to be acting out your dreams so we, uh, we wrote a book about the, our discovery of REM sleep behavior disorder called Paradox Lost, Midnight in the Battleground of Sleep and Dreams. And in fact, this is Mr. Dorff uh, in the process of throwing 12 consecutive punches in our sleep lab. Now there's a traditional uh, RBD clinical profile 
involving sleep-related injury in older men. Uh, the two large series were from our center in Minneapolis and from the Mayo Clinic. 96 patients from our sleep center and 93 cases from the Mayo Clinic. And our findings are virtually the same. This is a disorder of older males in the traditional profile uh, with dream and acting behaviors and sleep-related injury. Uh, there's a standard treatment now uh, for REM behavior disorder this, that was endorsed by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, published in the journal Clinical Sleep Medicine. First of all, it's important to protect the bedside environment. You want to remove sharp objects, bedside tables, that even the flinging your arm uh, can really result in injuries to the back of your hand. The two mainline treatments are clonazepam, the medicine that we administer to Mr. Dorf, but also melatonin is very effective as well, and sometimes you need combined therapy. The main point here is that these medicines have a benefit for up to 90% of treated patients. So at least we can protect them during their sleep. Uh, and I already mentioned about environmental considerations for making the bedside environment safe. Now, RBD at the time of diagnosis can be associated with a neurological disorder or be unassociated with a neurologic disorder, which we call idiopathic or currently isolated RBD. In other words, it's not associated with any other condition at that point in time. However, what happens to isolated RBD patients over time? Obviously, after discovering RBD and identifying a large group of patients who had no neurological disorder, we follow them. Also, I saw them every year just to monitor their medications and the treatment of RBD. Well, lo and behold, we published our first series in 1996 in the journal Neurology after we identify that 38% of 29 older males had converted to a Parkinson's-like condition. And we extended our uh, outcome study and eventually identified that 81% of these patients eventually developed Parkinsonism, Parkinson's disease or dementia Lewy bodies primarily. And interestingly, it took on average 14 years from the onset of their RBD to the onset of their neurological disorder. So there was a long latency period. Uh, there, here's a breakdown, 13 patients had Parkinson's disease, four had dementia of Lewy bodies, and uh, four others had uh, variations of this Parkinsonian syndrome. The Barcelona group, same findings, 82% of their patients with idiopathic or isolated RBD develop, eventually developed neurodegeneration. So let's focus now on NAPS2. This is an opportunity to address unmet educational needs in the community, consisting of the general public, physicians, nurses, other health providers. First of all, to educate about the existence of RBD and its potential for major, even life-threatening injury to self and spouse. Also, it's high prevalence, 1%. There's millions of people with RBD. There's an equal gender distribution. We now know that after a recent epidemiologic studies. Also, as I already mentioned, there's a high rate of treatment benefit from bedtime medication providing safety to the affected person. Also, there's high risk of future conversion to Parkinson's disease and dementia Lewy bodies. I gave you the data. There is now a critical need to identify the cluster of biomarkers, which are abnormal laboratory tests in these patients of isolated RBD that can predict imminent, generally within one to three years, conversion the Parkinson's disease and dementia Lewy bodies. And by the way, dementia Lewy bodies is what uh, ultimately claimed the life of the actor Robin Williams. So he had dementia Lewy bodies and RBD because we now know that 75% of patients with dementia Lewy bodies, such as Robin Williams, also have RBD. Uh, so we can predict with the identified cluster of biomarkers conversion to uh, Parkinson's disease or dementia Lewy bodies so that these high risk patients can be enrolled in studies to test promising disease-modifying or neuroprotective therapies. This is the cutting-edge research. This is why we need to recruit patients. This is why we have to alert the community about the existence of RBD and its high risk for Parkinsonism and the need to conduct systematic studies so we can halt the progression to these devastating neurological disorders. And obviously, last but not least, uh, there's a critical need to develop these therapies. So I wanna just, from my book, Paradox Lost, just quote what these people go through. Uh, and these are in their own words. I tape recorded them with their permission. It seems like I am extra strong when I sleep. And the wife says, it almost seems like a force picks him up. He is sleeping and his body is in motion. 
I don't think he ever could hit as hard while awake as he hits during sleep. A year ago, he punched right through a wall board in our bedroom at our lake cabin. Oh yes, there were always bloody sheets. It's amazing, you should see the energy behind that activity. Oh, it's unreal. He pounded my head one night and my head still hurt for another two weeks. His legs go fast, just like he's running. We put as much distance between us in bed as we can. I didn't really sleep soundly until he got up in the morning. So I want to give you a firsthand kind of flavor for REM sleep behavior disorder and place it in the important context of the science that needs to be pursued. And I really thank you for your attention. If anybody has questions, so you can uh, ask those questions in the chat box. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Yoel Ju. I'm one of the co-principal investigators for the NAPS Consortium. And I'm very happy today to be able to introduce the NAPS Consortium to our attendees. NAPS stands for the North American Prodromal Synuclinopathy Consortium, and we are a group dedicated to studying REM sleep behavior disorder. As uh, Dr. Schenk just uh, presented to us, RBD is a sleep disorder, but really of interest to us as scientists and physicians because of the, the link of uh, RBD with synuclinopathies. Synuclinopathies are a group of neurodegenerative disorders that includes Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, and multiple system atrophy. And while these are quite different uh, in terms of symptoms, they are similar in that they have these uh, clumps or accumulations of synuclein, which is a protein within the brain. Because so many individuals who have RBD go on to develop a synucleinopathy, our understanding currently is that many people with RBD actually have a prodromal or very early pre-symptomatic stage of synucleinopathy. Now, many of us who are investigators in the NAPS consortium are physicians who see patients with RBD. And when we tell our patients that they have RBD and about the increased risk of synucleinopathy, the first question we are asked always is, well, what can I do to prevent getting Parkinson's disease or dementia? And unfortunately, currently there are no known medical treatments to prevent or slow the progression towards a synuclinopathy. And in fact, what we need are neuroprotective clinical trials. These are trials to test different medications or treatments that might slow or stop the progression towards Parkinson's disease or dementia. Uh, unfortunately, right now, there are some critical barriers towards having clinical trials. One is that because RBD that has been diagnosed with a sleep study is relatively rare, we need to combine uh, individuals with RBD from a large number of sites in order to be able to have a clinical trial. Another significant barrier is that we don't have any biomarkers of synucleinopathy, meaning any type of measures of symptoms or things that we can measure in blood or by brain scans or other tests that we can use to track the amount of synucleinopathy disease in the brain. And so uh, for these and other reasons, we currently are unable to have neuroprotect neuroprotective clinical trials. And so because of this, we formed the NAPS Consortium and our overall mission is to enable successful clinical trials for treatments against synucleinopathies. The NAPS Consortium is currently at 10 different sites, and you can see uh, the locations and institutions here on the map. We are geographically uh, well spread out across the United States, and there is one site, McGill University in Canada. We have a website that you can see on the lower left-hand corner uh, where you can get more information. One of the uh, barriers to clinical trials is uh, that we need enough uh, potential participants for a clinical trial. And we had an initial goal of 300 people with uh, RBD, which was later revised to 360. And here you can see uh, the month and year on the x-axis. 
And on the y-axis is the number of people who have been enrolled. We started NAPS in May of 2018, and within three months in August, we had enrolled our first participants. The dark blue circles indicate when each new site started enrollment. And you can see we rolled out seven sites within one year, and we were enrolling at a very good clip uh, until early 2020, when unfortunately we had to stop all clinical research at all the sites due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Through a lot of hard work and resilience by our investigators, research coordinators, and staff, we have been able to resume enrollment at all the sites, and in fact, uh, roll out uh, enrollment at three new sites for a total of 10. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, we were at 331 participants who had enrolled, and we are well on track, as you can see, to meet our goal of 360 by the end of this month. Additionally, we have seen 80 people 85 people back for a second year and a handful of people back for a third year for well over 400 visits uh, for the NAPS consortium. Now, uh, those of you who are NAPS uh, consortium participants will know uh, what we do when you come for a visit. Um, and essentially, in order to develop biomarkers and measures of, of, of disease, uh, we are doing a, a pretty broad neurological testing battery where we test um, a number of different cognitive domains. We do a, a neurological exam and particularly with close attention to movement functioning. We test color vision, smell, and we get a variety of measures and questionnaires about other neurological functions. We're also collecting REM sleep without atonia from sleep studies that were performed in our uh, participants. Uh, that it's called a RISWA, and it's a measure of how much muscle activity there is during REM sleep. In normal uh, REM sleep, there is very little muscle activity, but in individuals with RBD, we see that the muscle activity is elevated. And so uh, one of the potential biomarkers we are developing is this measure of muscle activity to see if it correlates with the degree of disease. Lastly, we are collecting biofluids, specifically blood, in all of our participants. And at a select number of sites, we are collecting cerebrospinal fluid. This is the fluid that bathes the, the brain and comes into direct contact with brain tissue. And we hope to use both the blood and the, and the cerebrospinal fluid to develop fluid biomarkers that can tell us uh, about the degree of synuclinopathy that a person has. Now, uh, I wanted to move on to NAPS 2 because the original NAPS, what we now call NAPS 1, is actually going to end at the end of this month, so very soon um, at the end of a three-year run. About a year ago, we submitted an application for stage two of NAPS, which we call NAPS 2. Um, and we uh, recently heard that it, uh, it is expected to be funded uh, very shortly by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, NAPS 2 is much larger than NAPS 1. It is a huge investment by the NIH and really, uh, you know, by taxpayers into synucleinopathy research. And NAPS 2 will substantially expand the infrastructure for RBD-related research. The ultimate goal of NAPS 2 is the same as NAPS 1. Uh, our mission is to um, enable neuroprotective treatments and clinical trials in RBD as well as synucleinopathies in general. Uh, this next slide is a little bit busy, um, but I just wanted to show uh, how well NAPS 2 aligns with overall research goals in the scientific community for uh, synucleinopathies. These were different priorities or recommendations that were made uh, during an Alzheimer's disease related dementia summit two years ago. And you can see by the arrows uh, on the left here that NAPS 2 really meets uh, these, uh, these uh, priority items uh, in synucleinopathy research. Now, NAPS 2, as I mentioned, is uh, a substantially larger study than NAPS 1. Uh, we will continue with the same 10 sites that we currently have. Um, and in addition to the sites, uh, what NAPS 2 will have is a variety of cores that form an infrastructure for RBD research. So uh, the administrative core will interact with all the sites, um, as well as the executive committee, the scientific advisory board, and um, an outside uh, organization such as foundations, scientific organizations, 
uh, pharmaceutical industry partners, and patient advocacy groups. There are other cores that are devoted to uh, analyzing the data or samples that are collected at the sites. For example, there is a polysomnogram core to analyze sleep studies for uh, RISWA. There is a neuroimaging core to analyze brain scan data, and so on. And uh, after these data are analyzed by the different cores, all that information flows into the project, which is titled Predicting Phenoconversion. And this gets at the main question or questions that uh, we have about RBD, which is how can we uh, use the information that we get uh, from different um, uh, blood tests or uh, fluid tests or uh, brain scans um, or any of the neurological assessments that we do to predict who will develop uh, synucleinopathy when which type, and uh, hopefully uh, what type of treatment will they be most likely to respond to. Uh, and from the point of view of the participants, NAPS2 will be a little bit different from NAPS1. One is that we will see people that longitudinally every year, hopefully, for the broad neurological testing. We are going to add brain scans, both MRI and DAT scans. We will add sleep studies or polysomnograms to the uh, uh, to be done for this research study. We will collect blood from everyone again, um, and we will expand the cerebrospinal fluid collection to all of the sites, and we will really push to um, have as many of our participants provide samples as possible, uh, because uh, likely um, any biofluid biomarkers that are identified will be done so using the CSF as opposed to blood. Uh, lastly, we will also enroll control participants without RBD um, so that we can compare some of the biomarkers that we are developing. Uh, here are all of the investigators here in this table and involved in NAPS2. On the right are uh, the people who attended the NAPS1 um, investigator meeting a year ago. Um, I do want to acknowledge all of the investigators uh, involved in NAPS, as well as, of course, the participants, without whom we couldn't do any of this research, and uh, they have uh, really devoted a lot of time and effort um, to this research. I'd also like to acknowledge our, our senior administrative uh, personnel, as well as the uh, clinical research coordinators, staff, and uh, students that we have across all of the different sites and cores for uh, the NAPS Consortium. I'm uh, happy to take any questions during the Q&A. Thanks for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would uh, uh, like to echo my colleagues in uh, welcoming uh, you all to this uh, um, great milestone for NAPS initiative, our first uh, annual webinar um, uh, for participants uh, in uh, NAPS projects and for a broader RBD community. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Alex Videnovich and um, uh, in this presentation, uh, I will, uh, um, along with my colleague Alan Avidan from uh, UCLA, tell you about the exciting component of uh, NAPS2 project, uh, which uh, represents actually a public facing uh, interface of the project uh, and was titled the Recruitment Education and Outreach Core um, or uh, abbreviated uh, RIO Core. Um, so uh, with this program, we aim to uh, um, be a liaison between NAPS consortium and um, broader community, specifically research participants, general public, our colleague, uh, colleagues in medical and scientific community, and other key stakeholders and partners. And here um, you can see what are uh, our major objectives that we would like to accomplish under umbrella of this Rio 4. The priority is obviously to facilitate recruitment and retention uh, of research participants that uh, will become associated with projects uh, of NAPS2 and to pay a special attention in recruiting a diverse group of um, research uh, participants. We will aim also to develop 
and implement educational uh, and training programs that are centered on RBD and related disorders that you just heard about. Uh, we will work um, hard to um, achieve appropriate outreach, which will um, really um, serve two, two major objectives. One, to inform and raise the awareness of um, general public of lay individuals about the RBD and its associations with other neurodegenerative disease, uh, and certainly to form uh, strategic relationships with the key stakeholders that are going to be very relevant in advancing uh, therapeutics and clinical trial development in this space. And obviously, we will look how well we are doing and be very critical in assessing the effectiveness of our activities. How well are we reaching general public? How well are we interacting with you all um, uh, and with your families? Um, let me uh, tell you a little bit about the recruitment and retention efforts. Uh, uh, we have done um, uh, really very well with the recruiting uh, participants in NAPS 1.0 uh, phase. And now we will really work hard to uh, recruit participants from minority ethnic groups and, and uh, women. Uh, we will form recruitment, retention, and diversity committee, which is very, very relevant to you as well, as we intend to include patient advocates on this very important committee that will guide um, recruitment techniques and also oversee our success in recruitment and retention of our participants in our program. Uh, uh, we will employ uh, innovative methods for recruiting uh, individuals affected by RBD into our program uh, on, a, on a larger population uh, level uh, and certainly um, align all of these activities uh, with the uh, NAPS Education Committee, which Dr. Avidan will mention soon when he starts discussing educational goals that we have, uh, that we have formed. A very important tool um, for uh, the success uh, of NAPS 2.0 and for moving this uh, field forward will be creation uh, of NAPS registry, which will recruit patients um, with RBD, those who are already part of our program, but also those who are really um, not specifically linked to NAPS to um, uh, research programs. Uh, patients and their physicians will have a uh, easy way to um, uh, reach that NAPS registry and to uh, enroll through a portal that um, uh, is called Remedy that you will hear about very soon. Uh, and uh, um, this uh, NAPS uh, registry will serve, therefore, as a very um, important recruitment platform for NAPS too but uh, in a broader sense, will also provide uh, uh, a great resource for advancing, advancing clinical trials in this space uh, and, um, um, and um, hopefully arrest the progression of these neurodegenerative disorders that, um, uh, that are linked with the Ramsey behavior disorder. Uh, we also plan to have a, a robust outreach activities and uh, uh, we will um, engage with the general public and RBD patient community, develop uh, various educational programs that will inspire uh, RBD community to become part of, uh, of NAPS2 programs. We'll aim to develop materials that are going to be um, directed to general public um, and provide education uh, about clinical research and clinical trials in general and specifically to um, uh, specifically about the relevance to RBD. Uh, we will promote community speaking engagements, um, attempt to participate in um, uh, radio, TV, uh, and uh, newspaper media activities, uh, organize various webinars. And these are all activities um, in which we really uh, intend to part with our um, RBD community, our patients, um, uh, with, with you all, uh, and also other uh, stakeholders in the medical and scientific community to make really the impact and to educate the public about REM uh, sleep behavior disorder. Uh, we also uh, plan to engage with the other state, uh, key stakeholders and um, um, those are 
various professional societies and foundations, uh, colleagues from federal agencies and industry partners, which are all gonna be critical uh, as we move to the stages of clinical development um, and use our collective uh, clinical and research experience to inform uh, future clinical trials uh, and development. Um, uh, in that sense, the pipeline development working group will be created uh, and coordinating uh, all of these uh, collaborative efforts moving forward. Um, and at the annual NAPS2 meeting, we have proposed to host the corporate roundtable which will bring the representatives from professional societies, foundation and industries together uh, to present uh, successes and findings of NAPS2, but also discuss the next steps and how to, uh, how to move forward to um, um, uh, clinical development and, and, and drug, uh, uh, drug trials, et cetera. We are very eager to work uh, and also learn from other networks um, that um, are uh, already well established um, and uh, have presence in relevant uh, uh, disease spaces uh, that, that um, uh, are relevant for RDD and um, certainly will do a lot to um, achieve cohesiveness and build internally our NAPS2 community through an array of um, uh, communication channels and, and events that uh, we have put together in this NAPS2 um, uh, uh, research program. So um, uh, a lot to be done, and uh, we certainly hope we certainly hope that you will be uh, engaged with the network and find a way find a ways to take active participation in many of these initiatives that that I have just listed on this few slides. Now it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Avidan, uh, who will be leading educational uh, platforms and mission of this core and overall uh, NAPS2 network, and he will. Um, discuss um, these exciting um, aspects of what's ahead of us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Alon Navidan. I'm a neurologist at UCLA. I'm going to follow Dr. Vidanovic's excellent overview of Rio to talk about the educational initiatives. It's really exciting time for RBD, uh, particularly in, in the arena of a uh, sleep medicine, because there is so much that has been um, gathered, so much information about the condition since it was first described by Dr. Schenk back in 1986. We know that uh, the patients who have the condition often take about seven years from the onset of uh, their dream enactment behavior until they eventually come to clinical attention. Now, that's too long of a time period. And it's often related to a patient coming in with an injury, a patient sustaining injury or a bed partner sustaining an injury that the patients are eventually um, brought for uh, formal sleep medicine evaluation. I think there is a lot to be said about the fact that uh, in, in the United States, the average uh, hours of medical school education devoted to sleep is not enough for two hours on an average over four years is, is simply too little to help provide medical students, trainees, and further on to uh, residents uh, information and tools and resources to be able to diagnose and consult patients appropriately. And there are two, two components to education. The first is a education about the condition education about REM sleep behavior disorder, how to diagnose it, when to suspect it, how to treat it. And the most uh, important component, however, is a second objective, which is what to tell patients about the condition. What does it mean? What is the risk associated with the diagnosis that I have just made? And I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of patients who have not been told uh, that there is a risk of neurodegenerative condition. And the, is, the reason why is patients, may, physicians uh, may be too uncomfortable or may be worrying about how the information would be perceived or may not feel comfortable in delivering news uh, that, uh, or a condition or a, uh, a risk that may only transpire 10 years later. Um, that, that is an opportunity for us, certainly. 
Um, so there is a need to educate patients, the public, family members, and particularly healthcare providers about trying to demystify and bring more value to, to clinical attention. It takes about seven years, as uh, has been shown in this uh, classic paper. But really, the uh, ability of using a well-validated educational website that uh, is a portal and a, a, a gold mine of information is our goal, really, and remedy is that educational website. I tried to come up with something jazzy, and you'll have to excuse me because I, it's not very clear how it came about, but it's from using REM, E in education, D in delivery, and ending with Y, but remedy resonates a ray of hope, which is why I think it's a kind of a, um, it, it has a, a message that there is something useful in, in it, and, and it's not just about making a diagnosis uh, or um, getting people interested in RBD. It's beyond that. It's using this diagnosis to get people motivated to participate in a clinical trial that may later on offer a ray of hope for neuroprotection. And I hope that Remedy captured that, captures this uh, goal uh, in, in its uh, educational fa uh, patient facing uh, uh, website uh, for additional information. I'm just gonna skip through and show you, this is the website. This is how it's gonna look like. It's gonna have a patient facing um, entry and a physician facing entry point and resources would be then deployed based on the stakeholder who is the browser knowing something about the browser will then help provide and launch the resources according to their needs. We hope that uh, eventually to be able to provide the um, appropriate evaluation tool uh, that this will really focus on how accessible the website is, how searchable it is, um, whether or not it's applicable to the needs of the stakeholder, it's valid, uh, whether it's relevant, high, of high utility, of high value. And we hope that we get a little bit more informa information on whether it really is, is a, uh, uh, mirroring and is appropriate and lined up with the needs of the stakeholder. So thanks for listening. I'm gonna pause here and uh, open uh, the forum for our Q&A. Thank you so much. Next, we will move on to the Q&A portion of the event. We will start with questions that were submitted online previously through the NAPS website. As Dr. Bove indicated earlier, please submit questions by typing them into the Q&A section located at the bottom of the Zoom window. Questions can be submitted anonymously. We will try to get to as many questions as we can. Any remaining questions that we are not able to address verbally, we will try to answer within the Q&A window. We will also post answers from this Q&A session later on the NAPS website, which is www.naps-rbd.org. Dr. Howell from the University of Minnesota will be moderating the Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, really appreciative. And uh, I, I'd like uh, to speak on behalf of all the investigators for the attendees today on how incredibly grateful we are for you joining us today. And uh, an extremely heartfelt thank you for everyone who is uh, a research subject and have, has, have participated in the NAP studies. Uh, those 330 individuals uh, and, and those of you who are thinking about participating, um, we recognize that every single one of you is an individual valuable person. I think the description that uh, Carlos Shank, Dr. Shank described on those first two people and the incredible stories, we realized the, uh, that every single one of you is uh, an individual with your own incredible story on how you got here, um, uh, dreams and goals for the future. And uh, we just are, could not be more thankful for your participation. Uh, and I, we're reminded of that all the time. I mean, all of us who uh, either have had a COVID vaccine or are about ready to get one, uh, we, we have those because of individuals who've participated in clinical research, so thank you. Uh, we also recognize that individuals, and we can see that as we've been watching the questions come in, 
um, you know, the, the stress and the strain of dealing with an RBD diagnosis and uh, thinking that you may be, you know, harboring some um, horrible underlying psychological conflict from dealing with this and yet is still be uh, such wonderful, beautiful people is one of the reasons why all of us have gone into uh, helping people with RBD because we really have uh, had tr incredible satisfaction in, in helping uh, those of you who are dealing with violent dream enactment or just dangerous dream enactment, uh, as well as uh, the questions that have come up in terms of uh, the emotional mental support in terms of helping individuals deal with uh, the challenges of being uh, diagnosed with a condition that puts you at high risk for a neurological disorder. Um, and we uh, very much, all of us feel very strongly that we are advocates for you. It is, it is our role uh, to help the world understand that this is a common condition affecting 80 million people worldwide. Uh, and with that being said, uh, I'll just go ahead and handle a couple of the first questions. Uh, does the age of onset of RBD have any correlation with the conversion of Parkinson's? And are there any qualities in the symptoms of RBD or protective factors for those patients who do not go on to develop Parkinson's? And a lot of this is we, all of us receive these questions of, okay, I have our REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, you know, am I going to develop Parkinson's disease or dementia? And when is that going to happen? And every single person is individual and we can take uh, other information that we uh, know in terms of other medications that you're on, other symptoms that you may have, your age. We know that the older you are, the higher risk you are for developing neurodegener a neurodegenerative disease. But that's true regardless. Uh, you know, when you're 90, you're at higher risk of uh, dementia and Parkinson's than when you're 70. Getting getting older is not for wimps, um, and so we 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 that is all taken into the calculation. The numbers are, you know, 50 to 80% of individuals within about 10 years uh, may develop uh, a dementing disorder, but really uh, this, is, this is by no means uh, for certain and our, our job is to help guide you through this. The rest of the questions, and this was a lot of good ones that we got, that does the severity of my RBD have any relationship to the likelihood of converting? Uh, how long from the onset of uh, dream enactment until people start developing symptoms of Parkinson's and dementia? What are generally the first symptoms of Parkinson's that people with RBD develop? Uh, and are there any qualities in the symptoms of RBD or protective factors for those patients who do not go on to develop Parkinson's? What I would say is the best answer for this is these are the questions that we are asking um, to help us understand. These are the questions that we're asking in NAPS and in NAPS too. Um, and I, I will go ahead and, and feel, send out a couple um, of the high value questions to my colleagues right now. I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, Dr. Brad Beauvais for the Mayo Clinic to jump on and ask the question which, is, which all of us receive, uh, which is why don't we have a clinical trial now, uh, Dr. Beauvais? And, and uh, our goal is to find neuroprotection. Um, uh, thanks, Mike, and hi, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, probably the best way to view that, there's two main reasons. One is the pharmaceutical industry has been very actively pursuing this for several years, uh, but they're just not at a point yet that they feel confident that they have an agent that will impact the illness. Hopefully, that will change over the next five years, but that's one aspect just in drug development. The other one is that um, and if you think about this, if you have an agent and you have REM sleep behavior disorder, and we don't know if, when, or to what disorder will eventually happen, if you start a medicine, how can you prove if it's working? And this is why we need biomarkers in longitudinal uh, data in a comprehensive uh, fashion. So again, underscoring the value of uh, those who are already kindly participating in NAPS and what needs to be done in NAPS too. So um, hopefully that's an understandable explanation. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Beauvais. Uh, question for Dr. Uh, Postuma from uh, McGill in Montreal. So I've read that drinking coffee can be effective in preventing Parkinson's, and I'd like to know if this is true. Another person stated that, I know that strenuous exercise can be effective in delaying the progression towards Parkinson's disease. Uh, do we know if and why that may be the case? Okay, so let's deal with the first one first. Uh, so this all comes from the fact that it's been known for 
decades that people who drink coffee are at lower risk of developing Parkinson's. And so right away you go, wow, that must mean that you know coffee protects against Parkinson's disease. But in fact, there are a lot of other, ex I see some people s sipping coffee. There are some other explanations. And in fact, uh, for example, caffeine could be a treatment for Parkinson's so that you don't you can't get diagnosed because you're being currently treated. Or uh, there's something else that's found. So caffeine drinkers all also tend to do this X, Y, or Z. Or even more, it sounds weird, but I think it's probably the actual answer is that people who are in the process of getting Parkinson's lose the ability uh, not the ability, but lose the reinforcement that comes with certain kinds of behaviors like caffeine drinking and smoking, which is another one. So you don't get the same kick, so you just kind of stop or you get more prone to side effects, so you stop. We actually looked at this in a study. We've done a, a fairly large study, which we stopped early in Parkinson's disease because we didn't see any evidence of benefit of caffeine for Parkinson's disease. And uh, it didn't look like it was protecting neurons either. But you know, the, the jury is still out. There is a chance that, that coffee is protective against uh, Parkinson's disease, but by, that is by no means the likeliest explanation. You can drink coffee like everybody drinks coffee. You know, uh, two or three cups a day is perfectly healthy and I, I see no reason why not. Now, the second question is exercise. And, and here there's a little bit more evidence that, ex well, there is very strong evidence that exercise is beneficial, okay? It's beneficial for Parkinson's disease, it's beneficial for dementia, but that's no surprise. It's extremely beneficial for health in general. There's very good evidence that people who exercise actively, even who are assigned to say in a trial and are, are given exercise and the other group is not given exercise, the people who are given exercise do better. They look healthier, they're, they're thinner, but their, their Parkinson's in fact also looks a little bit better too. Um, and so again, why uh, is the exercise just making you generally healthier? Is the exercise providing a symptomatic treatment? In other words, it's boosting your dopamine. It's sort of mimicking what the medications of Parkinson's do. I think that's probably quite likely. And or is exercise preventing neurons in the brain, the brain cells in the brain from dying? Uh, that would be the most exciting. And if that would be true, then we would really have to uh, be pushing exercise very hard. And we don't have the answer to that. There are some interesting animal experiments. Of course, you can only do this in animals, uh, looking at you know, ex uh, exercising versus not exercising and seeing how much the neurons survive after they get injured. And it shows that maybe there's some truth to this. But regardless, uh, Exercise, get a lot of exercise, work hard, uh, not just, you know, a little walk in the park. Uh, you sh every day you should be sweating because you exercise. And I don't think it really matters what kind, whatever you do a lot of and whatever you enjoy, that's the key. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Postuma. Um, common question on um, the inherited factors related to REM sleep behavior disorder. So we'll call on Dr. Miranda Lim from the uh, uh, VA Portland Health System. So question, Dr. Lim, uh, my father has Parkinson's disease and I have RBD. How does that affect my risk of developing Parkinson's? And a related question, if I have RBD, what is the risk that my kids could get RBD? That's a great question. You know, there haven't really been very many studies looking at this exact question. Um, but what we do know about RBD is that it can, but not always run in families. Um, there's one recent study that's coming to mind um, that looked at 300 patients in 2013. And this was actually co-authored by Dr. Postuma um, and other investigators um, in NAPS from our Montreal site. Uh, and they found that 14% of patients with RBD also reported a family history of dream enactment in a first degree relative. Um, this is compared to only about 4% of control patients without RBD. So, and we know that other studies on Parkinson's disease suggest a similar percentage that about 15% of patients with Parkinson's also have a positive family history of Parkinson's. Um, I think this, is, this topic is, um, a really important question that we're hoping to answer by doing our current NAP study. Um, we are in the process of analyzing the data that's been collected from the first visit. So if you uh, were a participant, you probably recall that we do ask you about your specific family history during the research visit. And so far we have some preliminary data, it's not published, um, but we found that in the first 300 or so participants that 
over 5%, so one in 20 of you, um, reported fathers with RBD and 3% reported brothers with RBD, whereas less than 1% of you reported mothers or sisters with RBD. And about 3% of you reported Parkinson's and fathers, 3% uh, reported Parkinson's and brothers, and 2% reported Parkinson's and their mothers. So interestingly, um, you know, all in all, I think there probably is um, some uh, small but sig significant genetic contribution to RBD. Um, I know this doesn't exactly answer your question about what is your risk of Parkinson's or your kid's risk of RBD, but we hope to have more answers soon as the data continue to be collected. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lim. A uh, question to uh, Dr. Ju from um, uh, WashU related to uh, the NAPS2 and, and how that will work. If there is an opportunity for me to enroll in an RBD drug trial, would I be able to participate and still volunteer in the NAPS studies? And would NAPS2 do a clinical trial if a good drug or any intervention exercise supplement would be identified? Yes, uh, to both questions. So uh, we will we would certainly encourage uh, any of our enrolled participants to uh, also uh, be in treatment trials. Of course, that's our overall mission. And then if there is a good uh, potential uh, medication that's identified with a good safety profile, then I think we would be very motivated as a group to actually run a trial uh, within the NAPS consortium. Uh, that being said, I think uh, something that's really important to emphasize is um, that uh, uh, having cerebrospinal fluid <clears throat> samples uh, on uh, participants will make it much more likely that number one, uh, we will have the biomarkers needed to uh, proceed with the trial, and number two, uh, those participants would likely be selected for uh, enrollment in a trial. So uh, that's just to uh, reinforce the importance of uh, having the lumbar punctures for the CSF collection. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ju. And that actually transitions nicely into our next question related to imaging. So uh, in addition, just to thanking all the participants for doing what they've done already, we really can't emphasize enough uh, that, you know, that some of these, some of what we're asking you to do is not uh, always the most comfortable, you know, doing a lumbar puncture, we realize while it is an extremely safe procedure, uh, does cause some discomfort, and we are extremely thankful for you participating anyway. And related to that is doing an MRI scan. Doing an MRI scan can, uh, it takes a while, it's loud, um, it can be uh, uncomfortable, but uh, Dr. Susan Criswell from WashU, would you, would you describe to us a little bit about what information we're learning and we can learn uh, from neuroimaging of uh, individuals with REM sleep behavior disorder? I'm sure in this study, we're asking participants to do an MRI study as well as a DAT scan. Uh, DAT scan, people may have heard of in relationship to assisting with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. DAT scans are typically abnormal when you have Parkinson's disease because you have dopaminergic dysfunction and therefore reduced uptake of the scan tracer. We have some preliminary data that shows that RBD patients can also have abnormal DAT scans and that this can change over time. So we think that the DAT scan in particular may be one of these biomarkers that can help us identify people who might be at risk for developing a Parkinsonian condition. Um, the MRI, similarly, this has not been quite as well studied in PD, but there are some suggestions of MRI changes in early uh, PD patients. And we would like to also know if this is true in RBD and this could be used as a biomarker for progression or for development of Parkinsonism later. Um, this comes into play also when we're talking about those interventions because for any intervention that might be proposed, we would love to see how that's working on the dopaminergic system when we use a DAT scan or when we use an MRI to see if it might be helping preserve or protect those neurons as part of the assessment of the intervention. Great, thank you, Dr. Criswell. Just, I'm gonna do two uh, quick more questions. I'm uh, gonna ask uh, Dr. Lim about uh, TBI and REM sleep behavior disorder. And also Dr. Shank, we are gonna, there was a couple of questions curious about what happened to those first two patients. We'll let you think about that and ready your answer. Dr. Lim, uh, what is known about RBD that occurs after a, uh, a traumatic brain injury? 
Yeah, thank you for this question. I, I did post an answer um, in the chat, um, but just to summarize, you know, this is something that we are very interested in studying um, at the VA, you know, where we're based because we have um, a large proportion of um, patients with TBI and also PTSD. We just published a recent study um, looking at 500 veterans at our site um, that shows that veterans with both TBI and PTSD um, are the ones who have a, a higher odds of diagnosis of RBD. So they had an over twofold higher odds, but TBI alone did not increase those odds. Um, but on the other hand, PTSD alone did. Um, and so I, I put that link in the chat if you wanted to look at that study further. Um, but I think, you know, this is a very new and evolving area um, and it's an important question. So thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Lim. Dr. Shank, uh, tell us what happened to uh, your first two patients. Well, as it turns out, uh, after we diagnosed Mr. Dorf, we uh, realized there was an animal model for REM sleep behavior disorder developed uh, in Lyon, France, and then uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, there was very good research on this animal model involving brainstem lesions, and that's where Parkinson's often uh, emerges from uh, brainstem abnormalities. So we had Mr. Dorf be examined every year by one of our most skilled neurologists, the head of our uh, neurology department, uh, David Anderson, every year, and he found absolutely no abnormalities whatsoever. Unfortunately, Mr. Dorsey eventually died of prostate cancer. We could not get a brain autopsy for various logistical reasons. Uh, so, but we have to assume he probably did have some early uh, Parkinsonian changes in the brain with alpha synuclein, but uh, it cannot be demonstrated because he died from prostate cancer. Now, Mr. Abel, as it turns out, he developed his RBD because of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a very particular type of bleeding in his brain. But we followed him very carefully over the years, and he never showed any evidence of Parkinson's disease. And he lived a very nice long life until his 90s. So his was the case of what's called secondary RBD. The, blame, uh, the brain bleed from subarachnoid hemorrhage triggered his RBD, it had nothing to do with Parkinson's disease. As I mentioned in one of my slides, in our center, about half the patients who present to us with RBD already had a known neurological disorder, such as stroke and other conditions, or even already established Parkinson's disease, and then later they develop RBD. That happens too, that you can develop Parkinson's disease first, and then later RBD, or develop dementia of Lewy bodies first, and then RBD. But anyway, Mr. Uh, 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 Mel Abel, he had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And he, had, he led, uh, lived a really nice long life without uh, any evidence of Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Dr. Shank. Uh, and thank you uh, all of the panelists and uh, for those attending. I think most for, to keep up, uh, keep up to date on what's happening, just pay attention to the NAP <coughs> website. We'll do our best to update that and give you uh, further uh, opportunities to participate. Dr. Joe. Um, I think that wraps up our public webinar. Uh, thank you uh, to all the attendees for your attention. Uh, we will get to any unanswered questions in the Q&A um, and uh, post the answers on our website. We will also post a recording of this session. Um, and then if the, uh, the speakers allow it, the uh, actual slides from their presentations. So thank you from uh, all of the investigators uh, from the NAPS Consortium. We hope to see you next year. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Yoel.